You're listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. Hello, listeners, and welcome back to Luke's English Podcast. Here is the next episode in my Beatles season, and this is where we look at some language too. In this episode, I'm joined again by Anthony Rotuno, who is a podcaster and English teacher from England. Anthony's main podcast is called Glass Onion on John Lennon, and as the title suggests, it's all about John Lennon, particularly his psychology and his life story. Anthony's other podcasts are called Film Gold, a film review series, and Life and Life Only, which is all about personal development and psychology. So Anthony knows a thing or two about psychology and John Lennon, and of course, as an English teacher, he's well experienced in helping learners to conquer this language of English. In this one, we are going through a big list of adjectives which I prepared earlier. All the adjectives are words that you could use to describe someone's personality. We have loads of these adjectives in English. So, Anthony and I made a list of words which could be used to describe John Lennon. It's an ABC, in fact, a sort of an A to Z of adjectives of personality. Now, we didn't manage to talk about every single adjective in this list, but we certainly had a good go at them. And so what you're going to get in this episode is a sort of English lesson with John Lennon as a case study, focusing on adjectives of personality. So here are the adjectives. I'm going to read them out in a moment. Um, and this is the whole list from A to I, and the J to Z ones will appear in the next episode. So yeah, we don't go into detail about all of these, but um, they get mentioned and discussed to some extent. So um, consider these things. Consider which ones you actually know, which adjectives you, you know, which ones you use, which ones you don't know, and which ones you don't use, and also word stress, okay? So these are adjectives to look out for in this conversation, all right? Um, so here we go. Abrasive, aggressive, ambitious, anti-authoritarian, antisocial, articulate, artistic, bad-tempered, brave, charismatic, charming, contradictory, creative, cruel, curious, cutting, cynical, damaged, disobedient, disturbed, egotistical, experimental, eccentric, fearless, fragile, funny, generous, gentle, gregarious, headstrong, honest, imaginative, indulgent, inquisitive, intelligent, inspiring, and irreverent. And that's irreverent, not irrelevant. Okay. Uh, irreverent with no L's in the word at all. So I will let you discover which ones we actually talk about in detail in this episode. The rest of the list will come up in the next part. Also, I've collected a set of other expressions from this conversation, uh, not using adjectives of personality, but just other useful expressions and examples of language that you could use. And I'm planning to use that set of, you know, target language in an upcoming premium episode. Uh, remember, you can always go to teacherluke.co.uk slash premium info if you want more information about the premium subscription and the sort of stuff that you get from it. Um, and that's where you can also sign up to LEP Premium to unlock all of the premium episodes. Right. Right, so now let's consider John Lennon's personality, things he did and said in his life, and try to work out what kind of person he was with a few useful adjectives in the process. So part two of this then. So this involves describing John Lennon uh, with adjectives of personality, right? So this is a common sort of way of categorizing vocabulary, looking at descriptive vocabulary, looking at adjectives, and specifically looking at adjectives that we use to describe people and personality traits. And there are many adjectives. So I, I thought we could use the topic of John Lennon, the context of him and his life, as a way to teach my listeners some useful adjectives for describing personality traits. Absolutely. So we, we've made a list of adjectives that occurred to us that could be used to describe John Lennon. And the list is long. <laughs> yeah. It's so long. We had to stop at some point. <laughs> yeah, we did. We had to actively kind of go, okay, we can't keep adding to this list. It's got to stop at some point. Which I guess tells us about something about John Lennon in the fact that, you know, he's a multifaceted individual and, you know, you could just go on describing him for so long. Mm. But anyway, let's go through some of the adjectives or phrases. They're, they're actually all 
mostly one word adjectives. Uh, consider what they mean and discuss how they could apply to the life of John Lennon. Okay. Okay. So um, I've got this big list. I tried to go from A to Z. Some some letters might be missing. So we'll start with just the A words, and maybe I can just list out the, the some of the ones I've got here that start with A, and maybe then we can just pick out one or two to expand on them. So we've got abrasive, aggressive, ambitious, anti-authoritarian, anti-social, articulate, and artistic. I think we should probably start with the word abrasive because this is quite a nice specific uh, word that some people might not know so should we just have a go at defining what abrasive means yeah can you define that one because i'm <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm trying I to can. think of it it's one of those words you know but <laughs> yeah go on sorry. yeah yeah of course essentially if someone is abrasive it just means that they're kind of rude in their manner with people mm. Right, and it, I think it comes from the fact that some some surfaces, some substances, can be rough and abrasive. Like, for example, if you're doing the washing up in your kitchen and you've got a, a saucepan with lots of food that's stuck to it, and you're trying to remove that stuff from the saucepan, yeah. you'd need uh, something abrasive, like one of those green scourers, or maybe even a uh, what's that uh, wool, that metal wool stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. To scratch it off. So abrasive. It also describes uh, surfaces that are rough, but a person can be abrasive so that when you rub up against them, ah, it can be quite painful. Mm -hmm. Uh, It means that they are, it basically means harsh, cutting, biting, rude, or maybe a bit unkind, an Mm. abrasive character. What do you think? Is it true? Was he an abrasive person? Well, one of the things about John Lennon is that there's a huge difference between John Lennon sober and John Lennon drunk. Uh, and, uh, you know, because if you, if you think of other, other drugs, like, um, I don't know, heroin, LSD, it's not going to really make you uh, nasty or aggressive. But alcohol, as we're sure we've all had friends, perhaps we've had experiences where a nasty side has come out. So I think he was probably abrasive anyway, because he had a good expression, a chip on his shoulder. Uh, mm. For obvious reasons, because as I said earlier, he'd lost his uncle, he'd lost his mother, he also lost his best friend, Stuart Sutcliffe, who died at 21 years old. He lost Brian Epstein. Um, so he had a chip on his shoulder. What's the chip on his shoulder thing? What does it mean? Yeah. Um, it's like you, you are angry at the world, and so you're, you're slightly bitter. So... Um, yeah, or like you've got some sort of, um, uh, like a weakness, which you're trying to compensate for. Yeah, it depends, depends how, yeah, how deep you want to delve. Yeah, it probably come, it comes from an insecurity, but the way it's sort of demonstrated, a chip on your shoulder is, yeah, you're kind of angry or a bit bitter about the world, so you tend to turn on people, perhaps. You yeah. know, what are those people? So I think John Lennon, both sober and drunk, was kind of king of the put-down. Like Everybody will say this he could put people down with a very cutting remark. And he was kind of a genius at that. You know, if you think John Lennon was a genius at music, he was also a genius at that. So, and there's all kinds of other stories that are in the Goldman book that I won't go into of him being perhaps a bit more than cruel, like being pretty aggressive and pretty violent. But uh, Mm. definitely there was that side to him. I think he mellowed over the years, as people tend to do. You know, he was 40 when he died. Um, But I think, Certainly the young John Lennon had that in spades, yes. People would often sort of say, uh, I think it was Ray Davis I read in his book that he once met John Lennon, or is it Tom Jones? Anyway, um, uh, Ray Davis basically said that he once, Ray Davis was in the Kinks, another band from that period, and he met the Beatles once, and John apparently sort of gave him a really hard look and sort of said something quite uh, a little aggressive, but also quite funny. I think he had run-ins with Ray Davis and Tom Jones. So I think I think I think Tom Jones. They sort of Tom Jones was going, "Are oh, you Scouse git?" And John Lennon was saying, "You Welsh perf or something like that." It's not unusual to be loved by anyone. I was doing um, "Thank You Lucky Stars," and uh, I, I had it's not unusual. I wrote my first hit record in 1965, and the Beatles were were on the show on the TV show. So I went to watch them rehearse in the afternoon. And I'm sitting there, you know, where the audience would, would be later on with my manager, Gordon Mills. So I'm waiting for the Beatles to come out and want to watch them rehearse, you know. So John Lennon was the first one out on the floor. 
and he looks up at me, you know, and he says, um, he's got the guitar, and he says, uh, it's not a unicorn, it's an elephant. He said, how are you doing, you Welsh puff? I said, come up here, you scouse, and I'll show you. So Gordon Bill said, that's his sense, his sense of humour, don't, you know, don't get the... <laughs> Which it was, you know, and then we became friends, of course, later on. But he, he was like, you know, taking the mick, or taking the p- like. I think that was the extent of that. And Ray Davis, I've never read his book, actually, I'd like to, but I think I did hear something about that, yeah. I think John Lennon, yeah, he was quite a scary character at times. But he, he was a bit, kind of like a bit of a school bully, not necessarily actually physically hitting younger kids, but he had the bully thing where if you stood up to him, he probably backed down and he probably respected you. Yeah, and people said that he had a kind of a, a, a front. So yeah. there was this person who had this scary front, but inside he was actually quite sensitive. Yeah. Uh, but he was covering it up. He was wounded and sensitive, but he would cover it up with an aggressive facade, um, which would make people quite wary of him. Definitely. I had a yeah. I had a dream a few years ago. I haven't dreamt about John Lennon and the Beatles as much as you might think, <laughs> considering I've spent so much time with this podcast. No, I had a dr- I had a dream that I was at his art college, and I was sitting in the room at his art college, and I could sense that he was there, and he was at art college. People would know him. Probably fifty percent people would say he was a really nice guy. The other fifty would say he was a bully, a bit nasty, and I looked over <laughs> in the dream. And I caught eye contact, and he hit, and he hit me a look. It was so threatening. Not yeah. like I'm going to kill you, but like I'm the hardest guy in this college. Don't don't make eye contact with me. <laughs> and I woke up. What the fuck are you looking at? Yeah, what the fuck are you looking at? And I and I woke up in the dream, thinking, "Wow, what was that?" So uh, I don't know. If, wow. I don't know how much dreams actually do give you a key to reality. That's a debate for another day. But it was an interesting. Yeah, uh, I think I think he would have been quite intimidating. But if you stood up to him, then um, I mean, you're a you're a boxing fan, aren't you? So Mike Tyson is a perfect example. Yeah. When he was in his prime, most of the people that fought him were terrified, and they'd lost the fight before it even started. Then when he found a guy who stood up to him, then he kind of didn't crumble. That's a bit of a again, it's a bit of a theory that whenever Mike Tyson was punched back, he crumbled. That's not true. But when you stood up to him, um, you know, he backed down. So mm, yeah. Mm, mm. Okay. <laughs> Um, all right. So that was, I mean, abrasive, um, aggressive. We've talked about ambitious. I think it's pretty clear, certainly in the early days, because what was that quote of like, you know, where are we going, fellas? Mm. To the top. Where's that? To the top of most of the poppermost. Absolutely. I think yeah. I think he did want to become a success. A hundred percent. Yeah, definitely. I'm looking really for adjectives here that I feel people won't know so well. Anti-authoritarian. Yeah, well, yes, there is actually um, a couple of good examples of that. Um, you know, we were, when we were saying earlier about uh, the Beatles kind of sending up um, what's called the pomp and ceremony and having to say, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, da, da, da. And you were saying quite rightly that the politicians started using them. Well, there was a fellow called Harold Wilson, who was MP for Highton, which is very, I think it's even in Liverpool or near Liverpool. Mm, yeah. And anyway, they, they, were pre- they were presented with the Variety Club Awards, And John Lennon had a fantastic quote, again, sort of anti-authoritarian and sending it up. He said uh, they they were given these silver hearts. And John Lennon said, uh, thanks for the purple (laughs) hearts. And the genius genius of it, and if John Lennon actually thought of this, then he is a genius. It's a double whammy because purple heart is a drug. It's speed. It's an amphetamine tablet that a lot of people of the generation would would take a lot of the musicians Absolutely. sharing around purple hearts so they'd break them up in sometimes because george also said i don't know how we're gonna we're gonna have to break it into four or that's something it. like that didn't he that's it um, but, but, but the ge- yeah purple the, hearts but the genius is that purple heart is also the medal that's given to soldiers in war ah again I, and i think it was i don't know if it's vietnam or or I don't think it was only Vietnam, it was any war, but probably in 64 they wouldn't have been giving out medals in Vietnam because America was not fully involved. But what a genius to come up with a, a drug and war re- anti-war reference. And, and also suggesting also that somehow um, the Beatles were like Harold Wilson's foot soldiers in some respect or the, the, the foot soldiers of the establishment that by giving them this award 
they were essentially sort of like turning them into their agents you know that they were being that they, they were becoming part of the establishment yeah but yeah thanks for the purple heart brilliant ladies and gentlemen mr barker mr dobson and the press <laughs> uh, just like to say it's it's very nice indeed to get especially to get one each because we usually have a bit of trouble cutting them in four <laughs> i'd just like to say thank you very much it's a great honor Uh, same goes for me. Thank you very much for giving us this silver heart. I still think you should should have given one to good old Mr. Wilson. <laughs> um, hang up. Anyone who knows us knows I'm the one that never speaks, so I'd just like to say thanks a lot. <laughs> I'd just like to say the same as the others. Thanks for the purple hearts. <laughs> About that, I would. We'd like to sincerely thank you all, and uh, we've got to go now because the fella on the film wants us, and he says it's costing him a fortune. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. So I think the anti-authoritarian at the start it was more, um, yeah, expression like he slipped it through the back door, so he kind of slipped in references that weren't obvious, like Purple Hearts, like you said. And the uh, famous one, the, is it mm. the Royal Variety performance? Mm. It, was it the Queen that was in the audience or was it Princess Margaret? I don't know. Is it the know. Queen or the Queen Mother? One of the two. I think maybe it might be the Queen. I can't remember. But. Anyway, either the Queen or the Queen Mother or, you know, some high, high level in the royal family. Um, so the Beatles were performing at the Royal B- Variety performance, this annual performance that was like the pinnacle of the sort of entertainment calendar. And, um, yeah, John said that quote which was an example of how cheeky and lovable they were Mm. but it was john poking fun at the establishment so he's like okay for this number for the people in the cheaper cheaper seats you can clap your hands but for the rest of you you can just rattle your jewelry yeah and everyone loved it and they got away with it they got away with it they totally got away with it because it was he did it with a cheeky smile and a cheeky grin and that was him in the sort of early beetle days later on his sort of contempt for the establishment let's call it yeah was a lot more overt and he campaigned against you know certain certain people and uh, yeah the powers that be or or as uh, we in the alternative media often call them the powers that shouldn't be (laughs) (laughs) so i I think yeah of all john lennon was a very inconsistent person yeah he he flitted from one thing to another but i think i think the general rebelliousness anti-authoritarian i think that stuck with him for his whole life so yeah. it's nice to know that he was consistent in some things. <laughs> <laughs> um, going through the B words, we've got bad-tempered and brave. I don't think we need to go into those ones. Um, we have charismatic. We've talked about that a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, charming. Um, contradictory. Yep. I feel like we've already sta- established that. Yeah. Creative, that's obvious. Cruel, we've talked about. Mm. Um, curious cutting and cynical curious we know i think that most of the listeners will know what that means cutting yeah so as you were saying earlier i think a cutting remark um uh some somewhat similar to abrasive but cutting is is a remark that's gonna make someone feel bad or feel small you know it's gonna put them down yeah and it, and a, it's put, off, a put, a put down a put down yeah absolutely interesting that sorry we've got abrasive which is you know, like, again, refers to the sort of physical things like rubbing, like ab- abrasive surfaces. If you want to strike a match, you have to strike it against an abrasive surface. Yeah. And cutting also refers to sort of physical um, things like that, too. You cut things with a knife. So he's, he was an abrasive person sometimes, and his comments could be very cutting, that they could hurt you, you know, sometimes. Yeah, I think the cruel and the cutting kind of go together as well i think yeah i do i um, think so cynical yeah she did a show on of life and life only one of the first ones where i talked about the difference between being cynical and being skeptical <laughs> mm. and the the idea of perhaps we should be cynical you know in terms of you know our leaders and so forth or skeptical we should be cynical or skeptical i think both really but uh again it's difficult to define because i think 
I think skeptical is questioning and cynical is perhaps where you have your default setting, if you like, is negative or not believing in people. I don't know. How, how would you define yeah. cynical? I, I would say that's true. Uh, mm. If you're generally a cynical person, it means you assume that you, you kind of assume the worst, especially in other people. So if you're cynical about the government, you've just assumed that the government are lying to you, that they're mm. full of shit. Mm. You know, if you're a cynical person, it just means you tend to have a negative outlook on things. It's not exactly um, pessimistic. That mm. just means that you think the future will be bad. But if you're mm. cynical, you just kind of assume, especially with other people, you assume that they are maybe not being honest or that they've got ulterior motives and things like that. Yeah, I think the dictionary would say it's something to do with uh, always thinking that someone's intentions are not pure. I think, uh, you know, I mean, uh, as English teachers, we, you'll agree with me that dictionary definitions are good up to a point, <laughs> but they can be questioned. What, uh, we, what we really like is, is, is seeing examples of these words being used. And the more examples you get, the more rounded view you get of a word. Mm. So I don't know. Do you think John Lennon was, he was certainly sceptical. He, he questioned things. Mm. Um, I think it's fair to say. Was he a cynical person, though? Not necessarily negative intentions, but I think there's two things. The, the chip on the shoulder that we mentioned a bit earlier, uh, which came from all the rough things that had happened to him. So I, I think that's going to make you doubt people's that people have pure motives. I think also he was very... Uh, well, well-read is one of the ones we've got on the, on the list, isn't it? But well-read. He read a lot of books. He was a massive reader. He read... Apparently, in the mid-60s, he read like all the Sunday newspapers, more or less from cover to cover. He's a very, very informed person. I feel like he's one of those people that perhaps knew things. I don't know how you looked beyond the mainstream in the 60s, but there must have been some avenues of alternative information somewhere. I don't know. I feel like, I mean, he read, uh, for example, 1984 and Brave New World as a teenager. So that's going to make you sort of cynical slash uh, knowledgeable. <laughs> so yeah. I, I think a lot of cynicism is not that you just think things are negative for the sake of it, but if you have prior knowledge of how the world works, for example, and, and if you think our, our governments have been lying to, the, to their citizens for thousands of years, you might feel like you, you know already, so you're cynical, but cynical with a bit of background knowledge rather than just being cynical for the sake of it. Right. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, you might be cynical for a reason, because, as you said, past experience, like if you have witnessed uh, lots of corruption in the government and you've seen evidence of lying mm. from politicians, then that will make you cynical. You will then start to see the world in a different way and you'll mm. start to think, yeah, they, these politicians never tell the truth. And mm. people will say to you, oh, don't be so cynical. Well, I think with politicians, just, just very quickly, I, I think what the mistake maybe people make is that they have a go at the personality. So they... People, there are people who just probably absolutely hate Boris Johnson. But if you've ever seen the sitcom Yes Minister, I don't know if you've ever seen... I mean, mm. I love that. I wrote a massive blog post, and I've probably seen every episode five or six times because it's just telling you exactly how the system works. It's yeah. quite amazing that it just passed everyone by as a comedy. But anyway, when you kind of know how it works, like, for example, I'm cynical about the fact that war is going to end in the next 50 years. I'd love it to. Yeah, so if I asked you, well, you know, do you think we'll see peace in our time? And you're like, probably not. And people no. would say that you're cynical about it, or maybe you're just realistic. It's realistic, but it's also the fact that the, uh, you know, again, I don't want to go into this, but there's a there's a war machine that keeps going, whether it's Obama or Boris Johnson or Margaret Thatcher or whoever. There's a there's a sort of power behind the throne, which I'm absolutely certain of. So, I think I think perhaps my view is that cynical isn't always a bad thing. That's Mm -hmm. try and sure. conclude god we're sure. doing well we're only on c aren't we <laughs> <laughs> but that just going back to the point you made there as english teachers when we teach vocabulary to our students especially adjectives and things like this we feel the need to categorize things as negative or positive often mm. it's like is this uh, adjective a negative thing or a positive thing but as you've experienced yourself, I'm sure, in lessons, sometimes words don't fit into those categories. Yeah. And they may be negative from a certain position, but sort of almost positive from another position. I would say, on the, on the whole, 
if I had to make a flash decision on whether cynical is negative or positive, I would put it in the negative category. Mm. But that's not the end of the story. That uh, being cynical can also be a positive thing if it if you see it in in the light of taking a a different view of things. Definitely. So we've got other things like damaged. Arguably, mm. he was a damaged individual. I mean, we talked about the childhood um, traumas he experienced and also the sort of drug uh, abuse that he went through and mm. also maybe just the levels of fame that he, he reached and that maybe sort of gave him some psychological damage. Uh, disobedient. Mm. Disobedient. This is probably quite a good one from the D category. Huh. Yeah, sort of on a par with anti-authoritarian, I would say. Uh, disobedient, you probably think more to do with children, don't you? Perhaps more than adults. Yes. But, you know, you, you know, we can all be disobedient at any age, I suppose. But, yeah, definitely. I mean, at school, he was a, what they call a dropout. You know, he was clearly was intelligent enough to pass his exams. And he did say that he did, in fact, pass the 11 plus. Uh, because he realised if he didn't pass the 11 plus, he was really on the scrap heap very early. <laughs> the, ele- the listeners, the eleven plus mm. was an exam that they used to take back in the in the old days, and it was basically an exam when you were eleven years old. And if you passed, then you would be put into a a certain kind of school where you would like learn skills that you could have that would give you a fairly decent career potentially, mm. right? And then if you didn't pass the eleven plus, you'd be sent to um, schools that taught you more everyday practical skills. So basically, your your whole career would be defined by this exam mm. and it would make or break you in a, in a way so if you wanted to go on to become a doctor or um i don't know what like almost any respectable high paying job you'd need to pass your 11 plus in order to get into a grammar school to get onto that ladder but if you didn't pass the 11 plus you know you might end up i don't know what what kind of jobs might you get if you'd not pass the 11 plus we didn't ultimately. pass the 11 plus uh i suppose factory jobs um Again, nothing yeah. against people who work in a factory, but yeah. sort of not factory manager, more like menial jobs. Low paid yeah. stuff, basically. Yeah, yeah. manual labour, physical labour, shop work, for example. He realised that he had to pass the 11 plus, and so he actually applied himself for that. But generally speaking, at school, in terms of authority, he didn't really obey. Absolutely. Or- I mean, the yeah. teachers just, again, if you want to go into psychology a little bit, the teachers represented everything he, he hated about the world, probably. <laughs> you know, the fact that his parents had abandoned him. And uh, I think he's, his aunt Mimi is a kind of uh, quite loved by some Beatles fans. But I just read a book by John Lennon's half-sister, Julia Baird, and, and, and her book and Cynthia Lennon, John Lennon's first wife. Yeah. Both their books paint Mimi as quite a wicked Almost a bit. And in fact, Mimi's dying words were, I'm afraid of death. I've been so wicked. At the, at the final moment of her life, in her 70s or 80s, she, she sort of acknowledged that she'd been quite hard. So perhaps she was harsh on John Lennon, who knows? But uh, yeah, definitely disobedient. I think that was one of, the, one of his characteristics. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. We've got so many other words here, but we, we're going to have to fly through them. It's okay. okay. Disturbed. I mean, disturbed. If you, Well, okay, we're going to have to do this one. Uh, mm. Disturbed. If a person is disturbed, hmm. Well, we talked about disturbed. Uh, unfortunately, we, we mentioned, you know, John Lennon's murder and mm. George Har- the attack on George Harrison, both committed by disturbed people, disturbed individuals. So, I mean, I'm looking at collinsdictionary.com here, and they mm. say, a disturbed person is very upset emotionally and often needs special care or treatment. Disturbed children, mentally disturbed people. Was John yeah. Lennon disturbed? Did he have sort of mental issues? Well, I did have a therapist on the show last year and he sort of took pains to say, I don't want to diagnose him, uh, which is obviously totally justified on his part. Um, Yes, I I think if he had been diagnosed, he may well have been bipolar. Um, He may well have been a borderline personality disorder as well. This is only speculation, but Mm. I think there may be something beyond sort of what we know of kind of eccentricity and being a kind of offbeat person. I I think it's quite likely he did, yes. The word, I I should say the word, it's not a very, let's say, uh, it's not very, I don't like the word peace. I don't necessarily want to use the phrase PC because that carries Mm. a lot of baggage with it. But Mm. I don't think that, for example, the therapist you spoke to, that person wouldn't use the word disturbed. 
Probably not, no. I don't it know. sounds like an old-fashioned way to talk about people's mental issues. Well, when I think of a disturbed child, I probably think of what they call special needs, where they're not capable of of um, being in um, in the swing of normal school life. You, know, you get people who like school, people who hate school, but most children, for, you know, whether they're bored out of their brains or not, they, they can tolerate the social aspects of it. And maybe a disturbed child may have social problems they may be autistic they may have asperger's and i recently actually was helping my father my father's a table tennis player and i was helping him coaching and a couple of the children were autistic and they were really lovely children but they were wildly unpredictable and they could suddenly go off uh, literally mm-hmm. go off and so i think disturbed is is yes i think of it sort of emotional disturbance and maybe difficulty in in normal social sociability let's say I think if if your par- if you were a parent and your child had learning disabilities and stuff, if mm. a teacher at school said, "Well, we're concerned that little Johnny is disturbed," mm. then you'd feel bad. It's not a very um, diplomatic word. Let's say, yeah, yeah. okay, all right. So, um, egotistical, arguably. I mean, big <laughs> yeah. personality. Uh, I, I, I'm. I'm uh, I don't want to stop on every single word. No, I, no, yeah. <laughs> I think we should focus on the ones that I feel that the listeners might not know. Egotistical, experimental, eccentric. Hmm. Uh, we've mentioned that, like he was a bit odd, maybe a little bit crazy, but in a sort of, probably in a charming way is, hmm. I guess, how we often use eccentric. Fearless, you know, brave, fragile. Definitely. Yeah, emotional fragility. Yeah, definitely. Fragile, a bit like, um, you know, handle with care, similarly uh, fragile items, things that could break easily, yeah, emotionally fragile in this case. Absolutely. And if you think of 1970, as we said earlier, you know, if you think he's, he's coming off heroin, the, the, the band he's been in since he was 16 is breaking up and he's just been through primal therapy, which is just absolutely ripping apart his insides, essentially, metaphorically yeah. speaking, yeah. to get to the core of all his pain, you know. Yeah. Oof. It's a lot to deal with. Yeah, a very fragile <laughs> period for him. It must have been so sensitive. Funny. I mean, we talked about how funny he was. Definitely. Um, yeah. yeah. Generous. Uh, I, I mean, I, I wanted to say something here on the subject of generous. I think that he, he seemed to be actually very generous w- with his fans. So he would be generous mm. with his time. And it seems that when fans came up to talk to him, he would be quite willing to, to talk to them. Like there's the, I think it's in the Imagine film. Is that oh, the name yeah. of the, the do- Imagine documentary? Imagine fake- John Lennon, yeah. Imagine John Im- Lennon. Imagine John Lennon, um, a documentary film. And there's that one scene where, I don't know which house it is, but it's the house that he's living in with Yoko, the one that Ringo used to own. Yeah, Tittenhurst Park. Tittenhurst Ascot. Park. Mm. And they're there, they're sort of like, just, I guess, recording the Imagine album and stuff. And one day this hippie arrives from the States. Yeah. And this, this hippie, who maybe was a disturbed young man, Definitely. I don't know. Yeah, and he's sort of gone on some kind of pilgrimage all the way from America in order to find John Lennon because he thinks that John Lennon has the answer and that he thinks that John Lennon in his music has been singing about him and his life, which is you know impossible. Mm-hmm. But John is like, do you know the story? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I had someone on the show, Dan Richter, who was John's assistant, and he's outside at the same time. If you look at Imagine... Dan's generally wearing an orange, uh, like a polo neck, I think. But he was out there, yeah, and it, this guy was called Claudio. And apparently, uh, originally people thought he was a Vietnam vet who had PTSD, but it's come out in the last few years that he wasn't a Vietnam vet. He was somewhat delusional, and he said, uh, I want to look into your eyes. And, yeah, as you said, amazing clip um, of John Lennon, just talking to him like he you just talk to a normal member of the public, which apparently John Lennon was very good at. And I yeah. understand that he invited him. He was like, you know, do you want to, do you want something to eat? Do you want yeah. to come in? And the, he invited him in, gave him some food and something yeah. to drink and stuff, um, which is incredibly generous that he actually invited him into his home. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that he was willing to just, yeah, as you say, just talk to him like a normal person. But I love that clip. I love the bit where John is going, you know, how can I be talking about you? You know, I don't, mm. I, I don't know you. I'm just mm. talking about myself. That's all I ever do. You know, I just like my songs. They're just like, you know, uh, uh, I just love the way he says, you know, I just, I had a good shit today or <laughs> I love it. you, Yoko. I love he, the way he puts those two things in the same sentence. Brilliant. 
Diana said to me one morning, we just got this telegram and it says, hi, I'm coming and I'll be there soon, signed Claudio. And everybody said, well, he can't get here, said. I said, no, I'm not so sure. And lo and behold, he turned up at the gate. Don't confuse the songs with your own life. You know? I mean, they might have relevance to your own life, you know, but a lot of things do. And we went through a number of things. The, the, the police wanted to arrest him, and John said, don't, please, you know, don't hurt him. And then I had this guy called Claudio saying, I'm coming, I'm coming, and I only have to look in your eyes and then I'll know. So last week he turned up at the house, you know. He was obviously very, very infatuated by John, and he sent a lot of letters, and some of the time he thought he was John, but he also wanted to meet him, desperately wanted to meet him. So we met, you know, I'm just a guy, man, who writes songs. We can only say hello, and what else is there? Yeah, I figured that if we met, I'd know, you know, just by reading. But know what? You know, if what I was thinking was true. Or what we Is it true? Well, I guess not. Right, I'm just a guy, man. But then, yeah. But then it all fits. Anything fits, you know. If you're tripping off on some trip, anything fits, you know. I think you were saying... Boy, you're going to carry that weight for a long time. Did that was just... That's Paul saying that. Yeah. Paul saying that? But that belongs to all of us. He's thinking about all of us. Remember that one, um, you can radiate everything you are, you can penetrate anywhere you go? Yeah. Syndicate him. Yeah. That was just having fun with words. And I was just having fun with words. It was an, literally a nonsense song, you know. I wouldn't tell you. I mean, you Dylan does that. You Anybody know, does it, you know. This, that, you know. They just take words and you have, you stick them together and it's like throwing the I Ching or something. You just see what happens. You take a bunch of words, you throw them out and see if they have any meaning. Some of them do, some of them don't. See, that last album of mine was me coming out of my dream. You weren't thinking of anyone in particular when you were singing all that. How could I be? How could I be thinking of you, man? Well, I don't know, maybe I don't care of me, but it's all, it's all somebody. I'm thinking about me? Or at best, Yoko, if it's a love song. <clears throat> you know, and I think maybe think about an audience in general. You know, if I'm singing old Hare Krishna got nothing on you, I'm sort of talking to any old friends who've been listening to what we were saying and saying, look, well, I think it's a, it's a lot of bullshit now. You know, let's forget it. You know, and that, as far as I'm concerned, you know, and... Uh, but that's it. I'm basically singing about me. I'm, I'm saying, you know, I had a good shit today and uh, this is what I thought this morning and, uh, you know, and or I love you, Yoko, or whatever. I'm singing about me and my life, you know, and if it's relevant for other people's lives, that's all right. Are you hungry? Hmm? Yeah. Let's give him some drink. It's like a bit of a put down for Yoko. It's like, yeah, you know, I just, you know, I'm singing about me, my own life, my own experiences, you know, like I had a good yeah. shit today and I love you, Yoko. <laughs> well, well, funny you say that because there, there is an alternative Imagine film that actually came out in 72 was a, was the one, it was basically music videos before we called them music videos from the Imagine album and Yoko's album Fly, which came out at the same time. And I mean, there, there's a clip of John Lennon on the toilet reading the newspaper and Yoko says, how is it? And he says, oh, very good. And you don't know whether he's talking about the, the result of him being on the toilet or what re he's reading in the paper. We don't know. So, uh, <laughs> But uh, I think self-indulgent self is another one. But, uh, yeah, I think for quotes and for gift of the gab, as I was saying, I don't, I don't know if there's anyone in history who's been better than John Lennon at that. He's just so quote-worthy. It's just unbelievable, really. Yeah. But, so we talked about how how he's kind of abrasive and a bit cutting and stuff like that. But also, on the other hand, he could be so sweet. And, uh, you know, a lot of the things I've read about him, people talking about him, friends of his and stuff, said that he has this. He had this incredibly sweet and gentle side to him as well. Definitely. Um, uh, which is very nice to read, you know, like you were saying before, the more you read about John Lennon, potentially the more you can learn that, you know about the the nastier sides of his character but mm. he was also lovely as well again re quoting george harrison in an interview you know yeah. the interviewer said selena scott the interviewer said to him you know he wasn't he was no angel was he and george was like well no he wasn't but he was as well 
he was very good. He was very good, and he, he was, um, in some ways, he was a, a slight genius. I mean, the, uh, but apart from that, he was still just some guy like the rest of everybody else. He was no angel. He wasn't, but he was as well. Was he? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, he was kind of everything, as you were saying earlier, you know, was he, was he positive or negative? Was he nice or nasty? He was just all of those things. Yeah. You know? Um, I, th- I think the gentleness comes out in a couple of songs. If you listen to the vocals on Oh My Love from the Imagine album or the song Love, um, there's, a, there's a gentleness and a fragility that I don't think was fake, you know. I just don't feel like he was faking that. I think that was real. Yeah. Okay. Let me keep going through my list. I've got headstrong, headstrong. Just if you're if you're headstrong, it would mean that you are. Hmm. Essentially, you're going to do what you, what you want to do. You're kind of quite willful. Like you get something in your head and you're going to do it, and no one's going to be able to stop you. I would say that was headstrong. I think he he was certainly headstrong. Mm. Once he got an idea. He was like, I'm going to do this. I think so, yeah. No one's going to stop me. Honest, um, I think we can agree is true. Imaginative, indulgent. If you're mm. indulgent or maybe self-indulgent, you just mentioned that. Mm. The idea of him on the toilet. The fact that he's filming it, filming himself on the toilet, you know, that's the thing. You could call that self-indulgent, right? <laughs> yeah, that he's indulging his own personal whims. Uh, so, okay. Let me go back to Collins Dictionary. If you say that someone is self-indulgent, you mean that they allow themselves uh, to have or allow themselves to do the things that they enjoy very much. So they just focus on the things that they enjoy themselves. And maybe John, in his art or or even just in his life, just after a while, just focused on only the things he wanted to do. Maybe even to the detriment of the experience of his audience. Like, for example... Uh, that some of the experimental albums that he made with Yoko, like Two Virgins. I was just going to say that, yeah. Go on, tell us about the album cover. <laughs> so the album cover of Two Virgins <laughs> is John and Yoko uh, completely naked, standing there, just completely nude. They took the photo themselves with an automatic camera, you know, a timer or something. And it's just them standing there in the buff, completely naked. Mm. And the, and the, the album is like experiment, experimental music that they made together one night when they were, I think they were tripping on LSD, I think. Yeah. First night together. Mm. Very significant moment for them as a couple. Cause as you say, it was their first night together that they made all this weird music and then they made love and they recorded this album. And then they, John was so determined to publish this because he felt it was so significant and important it was this is the sort of thing he wanted out there but if you listen to it i mean i don't know have you ever heard it yeah yeah i mean it, you know it's it's not it, yeah it's indulgent in the sense that um they yeah they had a na- naked album cover and they put out this music that they clearly knew you know people are not generally going to like it because there's nothing to please the ear in it you know it's interesting as a snapshot of two artists two legendary artists having their first sort of night together. I mean, they may, they may have actually been together before then, but I think it's generally accepted as their first, the time they actually got together as a couple. Um, on the subject of two virgins, I still think there's a market for a, a two virgins jigsaw puzzle. I don't know if you, uh, I don't know if you know anyone who puts jigsaw puzzles together, but uh, that, that, that would be a very indulgent thing to do, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I tell you what would be funny if the jigsaw was like the the um, the album cover with the brown paper sleeve on it. Oh right, so yeah. It would just be the little because, like, listeners, when Two Virgins was released, and it, was it released on Apple? I think it was Apple. I tell you what, it was. It was the Who's record label. Oh, uh, Track Track Records. Track Records. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And so because the record stores didn't want to have this picture on their shelves of John and Yoko standing there in the nude. And I love, I love the, the little quote from Ringo from the anthology mm. where Ringo describes the moment when John showed him the album cover. And, and like John's like, this is the album cover for, the, for Yoko and Mai's new album. What do you think? And Ringo apparently was like, oh, yeah, you know, very nice, John. Oh, yeah, I see you've got the newspaper in the shot there, yeah. as if his dick wasn't out. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> yeah. And also, um, 
Private Eye, you know, it's a sort of satirical newspaper that's been going for since then, basically, or even before then. Yeah, around this time, John Yoko also got busted for uh, marijuana or cannabis, which was had big ramifications for John Lennon because it kept him, um, he had a big fight to, to stay in America in the 70s. Anyway, Private Eye had uh, John and Yoko naked, with uh, probably with their private parts um, covered, and the caption was, uh, I'm sorry, officer, it just won't stand up in court. <laughs> Because it was also around the time they were... Yeah, you can explain that to the listeners. But, uh... it, it, yeah, I will. If something stands up in court, ladies and gentlemen, it means that it can be used as evidence or, or that mm. the judge will consider it to be a valid thing to present or to say. Yeah. So, for example, a story that you might have, like an alibi, let's mm. say, describing where you were on a particular night oh no officer i i, I wasn't uh I, I was um having dinner with my girlfriend and you know the police were that's not going to stand up in court jimmy yeah. we know no. where you, your girlfriend's you know we, we know your girlfriend was with her parents that night come mm. on jimmy uh, yeah. that's not going to stand up in court so yeah. so that's not going to stand up in court is a phrase meaning yes this won't be this won't work in a trial the they judge won't believe won't, you mm. that no one's going to believe you and yes, so literally, do I need to be explicit? Um, that's something that might have a double meaning, listeners. Um, that won't, a picture of John Lennon naked and the subtitle, this isn't going to stand up in court. Huh? Come on, listeners. Come on, everybody. You understand the innuendo, don't you? You don't make me explain it word for word. And we come from the land of innuendo as well, don't we? We do. Whether we watch Carry On films or not. Um, we, I think yeah. Eng- England is a... Uh, Probably the home of innuendo. Well, <laughs> you know. the resting place of innuendo. Maybe it's where innuendo likes to spend its time. I think that everyone <laughs> in the world has its has their innuendos too. But for some reason, we just have a lot more. Well, because um, we've always been known as being massively repressed as a nation, so we have to we have to put things in innuendos. We can't say it out loud. Can't talk about sex. No, can't just talk directly about sex. <laughs> All right, moving on, moving on, moving on. Uh, inquisitive, meaning uh, questioning. Intelligent, yes. Inspiring is obviously true. He's inspired you to do lots of podcasts, <laughs> at least. Ir- irreverent, irreverent is a good one. And this is irreverent, not irrelevant. Irrelevant <laughs> just means not important and uh, not, not relevant to anything. Are you talking about Ringo Starr's solo career? Please, stop. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. I don't know. Some of the some of the podcasters um, would disagree with you on that. They would. They would. Yeah. There's quite a lot of um, coverage of his solo works and stuff. That would be so irrelevant, not important or relevant. But this is irreverent, irreverent. So, Mm. hmm. Okay. Shall I shall I refer to Colin again to let Colin do the work? Yeah, I was going to say it comes from the verb revere. So revere would be look up to, which is a pretty good phrasal verb as well. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. yeah, see what Collins says. So CollinsDictionary.com um, says that if you describe someone as irreverent, you mean that they don't show respect for people or things that are generally respected. But Ooh. I feel like there's more to it than that. I feel like there's a, there's a sense of humour in there. If you're irreverent, it sort of means mm. that you're poking fun at people who are normally in positions of high status. No. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think um, I think in England was also one of the first c- countries to develop the satire. The satire boom was sort of the. I suppose you could call the goons satire. I'm not sure if I would, but in the '60s, suddenly, you know, before the '60s, you didn't really make fun of politicians. So I think irreverence and humour have kind of got connected because humour is such a great way to be irreverent, rather than you know telling someone to f off. It's much more effective to make a joke about them. Yes. You say? I would say so. So Cambridge Dictionary Cambridge Dictionary says um, irreverent means that you're it means not showing the expected respect for official, important or holy things. So yeah, mm. being disrespectful to sort of things positions of power, official things. Um, and yeah, as exa- exactly as you say, in many cases that would involve making fun of those things. So irreverence Often mm. it goes, goes hand in hand with humour. Definitely. Yeah. yeah, we've got to stop soon, haven't we? Yeah, but we can definitely do... We can take it up because I'm loving this. It's great. 
Okay. Well, we're going to need to stop here. So we got to uh, mm. I. So we, from J to, well, the rest of the alphabet, we can do that at another time. <laughs> All right. So let's wrap things up quickly. Anthony, okay. thank you for taking the time to do this. It has been great fun. So, you know, I, I hope you feel that it's been um, a sort of two hours or two hours and 15 minutes uh, well spent. Absolutely. Thank you for your insights and your comments. It's been really interesting. And we should do this again sometime. So we'll be in touch to sort out sort of a, 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 a third part to this. Yeah, we've got to start from J, haven't we? We can't. Uh... We do. We can't leave the alphabet unfinished. <laughs> yeah, because your, your listeners might think the alphabet finishes I, which would be terrible. You know, that would be an injustice. Newsflash, listeners. The alphabet in English only goes up to, to I. Okay. <laughs> no, as I say, thanks. You kept me on my toes. Um, <laughs> you've had some good questions and we've had some nice in-depth discussions. So it's been fun. So there you go. That was the end of the sort of A to Z of John Lennon. That's the first part. I'm calling it part A and part B will be coming soon. Thank you again to Anthony for his contribution. Um, Yeah, so we will be back in the next part of this series. I'm not sure when that's going to arrive. Uh, It might be the next episode or it might arrive in 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 a short while. But let me know your thoughts in the comments section as usual. Don't be a ninja. Right. If you now, if you were a ninja, this is a thing I've I've noticed recently. This is a sort of trend that I've noticed lately. So we all know what a, a ninja means. It means someone who never ever comments. These are just numbers um, in my statistics. You just never comment. I don't know who you are. I don't know who you are. <laughs> I don't know who you are. Um, uh, uh, what was I? What was I saying? So these people, I don't know who they are. They're just sort of silently out there, just listening without ever commenting, without ever showing um, who you are. Those people are ninjas. And and um, there's also another thing, another phenomenon, which is people who were n- previously ninjas, and then they kind of come out of the woodwork and leave one comment and say, "Hey, I'm not a ninja anymore," ha ha, and then they disappear forever as well. So I think those people still need to be classified as ninjas, all right? So if you were a ninja and you left one comment and then you went back to being a ninja, then you are a a second-level ninja now, okay? So first-level ninjas are the ones who who just never comment. Second-level ninjas are the ones that comment and then just disappear. And you don't want to know what makes a third-level ninja, okay? You don't want to know what what that is involved in that. But anyway, don't be a first- or second-level ninja. Leave your thoughts in the comments section. It's always uh, nice to read your comments and to see you discussing things with other lepsters and stuff so um, get involved and leave a comment in the comment section it's a good way to practice uh, writing your thoughts down in english i think okay so the next part of this will be arriving soon but for now it's just time for me to wish you all a very safe and um sort of fortuitous goodbye by saying goodbye to you which i'm going to do now when i say thank you for listening and goodbye bye 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 Thanks for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk.